here's what I always do. And it's re- it, to me, it's been really helpful. I announce out loud generally to myself, I'm going to write the shittiest scene ever written <laughs> right now. I'm going to write the most expository on the nose piece of nonsense. Let me ask you guys this, and, and, and both of you can speak to this, and I want you to speak from the heart because, again, we ask this question, and sometimes it could, most people, they'll answer it, and sometimes we can tell what's a little cliche, and sometimes, but we can feel it from their heart. So let me ask you this if you guys had to both give advice, give advice to aspiring writers, what would your advice be? That 16 year old kid in high school right now with that med notebook or that composition notebook, I mean, what would you tell them? I would tell them, I'm going to only speak to, uh, movie or TV writing. But yeah. my one piece of advice would be that um, once they start, they need to uh, let it overwhelm them. What they need to do is start writing. Once you start writing, you can't stop. I'm not saying you have to work 12 hours a day, even if you only have a half an hour. You need to keep it on your mind all the time. So if you're at school and you have a you know part-time or full-time job, or you're you know a young parent or whatever, you what you have to do is make sure that you don't let it get away from you. So to say, oh, you know what? I'm busy today. I'm gonna start on it tomorrow. The problem is if you let it go for one day, that turns into two. That turns into a week, a week, that turns into a month, and then it's gone. And that yeah. that and that's not writing. Even if you can just grab um five minutes to look over what you'd written the day before and then push it forward a little bit, that means it's still present. So so uh that's one thing. The second piece of advice I'd give, which is just about writer's block. Um, writer's block often happens when you get past the point where you know what you're doing (laughs) and either you're afraid to write something uh, that you're not sure of or that feels wrong or whatever. Here's what I always do. And it's to me, it's been really helpful. I announce out loud generally to myself, I'm going to write the shittiest scene ever written (laughs) right now. I'm going to write the most expository on the nose piece of nonsense. And once I do that, I've exercised the demons of having to be great on a first draft, which you rarely are, unless you're like Charlie Kaufman or someone. And so I write the most on the nose scene I can do, can write. And then at some point it starts to flow again. You can go back and rewrite that crap. And then you just, actually, that's two bits of advice. The third piece of advice, final piece of advice before I hand it over to someone who's better at this than I am, which is Michael Cleary, is that don't give up when you're on a roll and it's now three in the morning or whenever, whatever your process is, and you're writing, 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 and then it's like, oh, Oh, great. I got through this whole sequence. Now I can crash. Don't do that. Start to write the next scene Mm -hmm. that you know, and then let it go. Because then when you come back to the next day, you know where to start. Because if you if you shut yourself off when you get to the end of a, of a sequence and you're satisfied with it, it's harder to start the next day. Always leave something dangling. So you can pick it up where you know, and then you can keep going past that. All right, I'll shut up now. That, that's amazing. That, that was awesome advice. Thank you very much for sharing that. And it's so true, that especially that last thing you said, because there's something that makes returning to the desk so much easier when you already have the foundation to just kind of play on and rather than, yeah, that that's, that's and, and stepping fun. away from something and, and letting yourself forget about it. I've done that once or twice. It doesn't feel good. You beat yourself up about it internally. And then eventually you're like, I'm just going to stop beating myself up about it. And it doesn't get done. And it's a very, and it's the hardest part about writing is starting to write. But once you sit down, it's so true. You're, it's, you're in it. 
That's that's awesome, right. Michael. Uh, yet again, he set you up for failure. That's hard to follow, but <laughs> well, go yeah, ahead. yeah, I, I I won't even attempt to to master uh, uh, match that. Um, you know, the, the probably the biggest lesson. Uh, there's a few, few, if you don't mind, uh, a few lessons. One is sure. your biggest obstacles to success. I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins, but your big will be yourself. And and unfortunately, for whatever reason in our culture, or what it, maybe it's just humanity people who are writers are very, very hard on themselves first. They are harder on themselves and think things of themselves that they would never say to another person. I think in a million years, uh, they will say to themselves, and that's crippling and paralyzing. And so, I, I, you know, that's a great, that's a very important lesson to learn is to feel entitled to this undertaking. Um, you know, we all grew up reading great literature. And then when we sit down and write two sentences and it's, you know, we compare our first two sentences to, you know, uh, uh, my name is Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> my, you know, and you go, Oh my God, I'm a failure. Well, no, you're just looking at it backwards. Um, yeah. so, so getting support, starting support begins with yourself, but then support begins with others as well. And I think longevity in this art and craft and business uh, really depends on the support of others, the understanding of others um, around you. They don't have to necessarily help, know how to help you block out your story, but they have to understand when you're trying to accomplish something, when you're trying to work. I mean, the old, the old, uh, you know, the old sort of saw is you know, the writer, the, the the wife or the husband, the writer is in the room staring at the computer and the other spouse comes in and starts talking to them and says, you know, when the writer says, I'm working, they say, well, you're not typing anything. You know, uh -huh. it, it's like learning to understand. If you guys want to, you know, see that in action, go see the Phantom Thread, Paul Thomas Anderson's ode to being interrupted by mm -hmm. someone who's not creative. <laughs> which is what that whole movie and he and he has the great line yes you will leave but the interruption will remain um, so, <laughs> That's so awesome. learning how this stuff works um is how it works it's not doing anything wrong it's just that is the process and so learning to feel entitled to the messiness of it and owning the messiness of it is a really important step in any mm -hmm. artist's development and the quicker you get to that the, the 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 more the happier you will be trying to create, um, and that and that takes support around you, but beginning with your with your own self. And I will recommend one book called uh, "The War of Art" by a fellow named Stephen Pressfield. And if you haven't read this book, it's fan freaking fantastic. Pressfield's a novelist, and he wrote screenplays and whatnot. He's a very successful writer, a wonderful writer. But he wrote a great book. He's written a few of them now called "The War of Art," and it's it's a just like just nuts and bolts, no airy fairy process, left brain, right brain. It's just all about, as he puts it, overcoming resistance, mm -hmm. the resistance to you doing what you say you want to do. Um, and it's fantastic. It just cuts through a ton of bullshit and it's a wonderful, easy read. And it's very inspiring um, because he talks about this process and how he gets himself to his desk every day uh and 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 is productive and that's it's what it's all about art. you say it's, it's called, called the war, war of art war of art by stephen okay. pressfield Amazing. that is great advice and that that again that's true too because my my wife is uh she she Angela, i didn't tell him to say this angela if you're watching she is a very tall uh she, she she's she's a chatterbox like she wakes up like a machine gun ready to go and i'm the exact opposite i'm usually in my head i'm i'm think and, and Neither of us are wrong. Neither of us are right. But the but what makes it work is the fact that she, um, she recognizes when I'm internalizing and and respect respects that like uh, she almost like protects that quiet time for me. And Beautiful. it is so instrumental in having that ability to be in your thoughts like and also. also to not, and to be in your thoughts in that quiet without having to feel guilty about the fact that you're in in your thoughts and in that in that quiet space. You just got somebody divorced. There's somebody gonna watch this episode <laughs> sitting next to their spouse and be like, you know, you never supported me. Oh, okay. good. <laughs> good then. <laughs> Let me do them a favor. Go find somebody that wants to talk, and you go find somebody that wants to be quiet. Hey. -oh. <laughs>